people of God. I mean, if you're new this morning, this is your first time, please just let me say uh, we hope that you feel welcomed and loved. It's a good place for you no matter where you find yourself spiritually. Um, we want to just continue to lift up praises to our glorious Father because He is holy and worthy of all things. So if you got your Bibles this morning, turn with me uh, to the Gospel of Luke. So still in Luke chapter 13. And like I said last week, we're going to continue in this series up until the end of May. So just a couple more weeks because that means that uh, summer is getting close. Anybody excited for summer? Any, any teachers, students ready for that to happen? Uh, that, that's good if you are. Uh, just to be honest, homeschool families like, like us, like me and my children and my wife, we don't particularly like the summer uh, because that means like when normal school is in, that gives us a chance to have like the zoo and Dollywood and Chick-fil-A to ourselves. Um, but then when school is out, what that means, like now we got to deal with people, right? Um, so people sometimes wonder, like, like why do y'all homeschool your kids? Is it for education? It's, it's most certainly not for education. Um, <laughs> so you, you can talk to our children and probably figure that out. Um, we, we, we homeschool our kids so we don't really have to wait in lines. Um, that's kind of the main emphasis that we have. Um, but look, this morning... Let's be honest, it's kind of hard to deal with people sometimes, isn't it? Like, like, we understand, like, dealing with people is not always an easy task. I think we would just kind of make the assumption that when it comes to people, if we could avoid most people at most times, that's what we prefer. But look, what we're going to see, we continue studying through Luke's account of Jesus' life today. We're going to see that even though it's easier to avoid people, uh, to kind of just let their problems be their problems and, and not really our problems, that is not Jesus' approach. So what we're going to see this morning is that Jesus is actually a compassionate Savior. He is actually a compassionate King. Um, so that's what Luke chapter 13 verses 10 through 21 will show us. So here's our main point, then we'll stand and read our text. Um, but what we see from our passage today is this truth, that two of the defining characteristics in the kingdom of God are this, compassion for those who are suffering, and then rejoicing over those who are no longer suffering. So before we stand, let's pray, uh, and then we'll jump in this morning. Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that we can come together as your people and praise you. We thank you for the encouragement and the edification that is the church. God, we just pray this morning that we would seek you out. We know that you tell us that we can trust in the fact that if we seek you, we will find you. And God, even this morning, we, we kind of fall into the camp. We, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Would you illuminate our minds through your spirit this morning? Just ask the Spirit's help to make things clear, to make things true, uh, to apply it to our hearts. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So if you can, if you're able, let's stand and read this morning. So Luke chapter 13, we'll pick it up in verse 10, and this is God's word. As he, speaking of Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her, and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue became indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, there are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, hypocrites, doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath? And lead it to water. Satan has bound this woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? And in verse 17, for now, when he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated. But the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he was doing. You can take a seat. And so in our text, what we have, we've got two people who I think at first glance seem to have 
not much, if anything, in common. So in this story, you've got a woman with a very serious back condition, and you have this leader of the synagogue. And if we happen to be at church on this particular Sunday, because that's essentially what the synagogue was, so it was the equivalent of what we do when we come together here, so that was their meeting place to, to read the Bible and pray and to sing songs. I'm just going to imagine that at least initially, we would think that this synagogue leader, who in a lot of ways was like a pastor today, so, so let's call him Pastor Chuck. So I don't imagine that we would imagine Pastor Chuck would have anything in common, anything relatable with this woman doubled over. Let's call her Debbie Downer. I mean, Pastor Chuck, he is up front. Debbie Downer is forced to sit where? She's forced to sit in the back. Pastor Chuck, he's known by everyone there. Debbie Downer can't even look up to see who is actually there. So in many ways, these two people, they seem like polar opposites. But I think this morning, if we look a little bit closer, I think we'll see Pastor Chuck and Debbie Downer they have at least one thing in common. So both Chuck and Debbie are in need of some straightening in their lives. Like one of them needs to be straightened up, and then one of them needs to be straightened out. Now, if you hear somebody say that to you, so if you hear somebody say, I'm going to straighten you out, I'm going to straighten you up, that's usually not a good thing, is it? That's typically not a sign of approval of what you're doing. Like, does anyone have some PTSD from when your parents told you to straighten up and you did not straighten up? Things can go south quickly if that's the case. So, so did anybody's parents have, like, that magical snap that if you heard it, you knew, like, you better start behaving? Some of you are like, no, but they had a magical belt. <laughs> when it came out, I knew I better start behaving. But look, there are times... That we are told to straighten up, and that means that we're probably not doing what we are supposed to do. So I remember when my father would tell my sisters while he's preaching from the pulpit, like, like they're talking, not paying attention, like, girls, you need to straighten up. And, and I think I only remember those times because I think those are the only times I amen in church. <laughs> like, amen, Dad. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But look, although on the surface we might not see it, there is, in fact, a commonality in both the religious leader and this disabled woman. Because, you see, both of them are crooked, which means both of them need to be straightened. So one needs their posture straightened up, while the other needs their perception straightened out. But let's first start this morning with the woman. So here's our, our first thing that we see. We see a desperate woman with a crooked back. And look, maybe you've dealt with some back pain before. But I've had conversations. I know some of you are dealing with back pain even now. But if you've dealt with it, then you know a lot of times it can be miserable, can it not? But like back pain at some points can be almost unbearable. And in some cases, even with all the therapy, even with all the medical advancements, there are cases where there's only so much that can be done to relieve the pain. And so for this woman, nothing had relieved her pain in 18 years. For all these years, she's been dealing not just the little tweak in her back. It's not like this woman had just pulled a muscle. No, go back to verse 11. This woman had been disabled by a spirit for over 18 years. And we might hear disabled by a spirit and automatically assume, okay, so this woman was possessed so, so one of Satan's workers must have taken up residence inside of her. That, that's kind of like what we saw with the man back in Luke 8. But listen, that does not seem to be the case. Because oftentimes in the Gospels, when somebody is possessed, that demon will speak. When somebody is possessed, at the very least, Jesus will cast that demon out. But there's none of that here. So this should not be seen as demonic possession. But what you have here is spiritual oppression. So this is similar to, to the thorn in the flesh, whatever that was, that Paul was given in 2 Corinthians 12. And you see, this spiritual oppression has left this particular woman with a really bad physical condition to where she's bent over and she can't straighten up at all. 
And listen, there's been a lot of study done trying to figure out what exact disability. So, so what exact physical condition does this woman have? Again, recall, the writer of this book is Luke, who was a what? What was his profession? He was a physician. He was a doctor. So in Luke's gospel, he tends to give more medical details in his writings than anyone else. But what most people tend to think this woman suffered from was a disease known as ankylosing spondylitis. And if you didn't catch that, I'm not going to repeat it because if I did, I'd say another completely different way because I really don't know what I'm talking about. But here's what Mayo Clinic describes this disease as. It's an inflammatory disease that over time can cause some of the bones in the spine to fuse, making the spine less flexible and often resulting in a hunched posture. And so that's possibly what this woman is dealing with. But what we know for sure is that this woman was in excruciating pain. We know this woman had not looked anybody in the eyes in 18 years. So she's in a situation unbelievably painful and at the same time utterly humiliating. It's like one pastor put it. For 18 years, this woman, her face was drawn downward towards the dust. She walked as if she was searching for a grave. And I don't doubt she felt often that she would have been glad to have found one. And so you think about what this woman's experiencing. And you think about all that she's going through. I can't help but wonder a question in my mind as I studied the text this week. Why is she still at worship? Right? Like if she'd been struggling this long with such a debilitating disease, why even bother showing up to church? I just wonder, was it going through her mind as they read scriptures talking about the power of God? As they sang songs talking about how God will deliver you from your enemies. If she's not wondering, I wonder why God won't deliver me from this enemy. She's not got some questions like, is all this really true? My friend, have you ever been there? Do you ever have these questions, these doubts? But listen, while we don't know what this woman was thinking, I think she does serve us as a good example that in those times, it doesn't feel like God is working. And we have these times. Amen, church? One of the best things we can do is remind ourselves about all those previous times that God has worked. And maybe that's why she kept showing up to the synagogue. She just needed to be reminded. She just wanted to be reminded of who God is. Of what he's done. She needed to hear that even when... God doesn't give us what we ask. He still can be trusted. But whatever the reason, whatever the reason for coming to the synagogue, this would be a day unlike any other at the synagogue. Because even though she can't straighten up to look at Jesus, what's happening, church? Jesus is looking at her. And here's what's interesting. So what we've seen all the way through Luke's gospel thus far is that when suffering people, when hurting people are around Jesus, they're doing everything possible to get to him. They see Jesus, they're fighting through the crowds. They're taking roofs off of homes to try to get in his presence. So it's kind of like being at Bucky's when they yell out, fresh hot brisket on the board, right? Pandemonium. But this woman is different. She doesn't speak to Jesus. Jesus speaks to her. You see, Jesus, she doesn't approach Jesus, but Jesus actually approaches this woman. Verse 12, when he saw her, he called out to her, woman, you are free of your disability. Then he laid his hands on her. Look, laying hands on her would actually have been very unusual, very taboo for, for a man to do to a woman in this culture. But look, look, there's no sin, there's, there's no weirdness here. This is just affection. Jesus puts his hands on her to show her, to show the crowd his great compassion for those who are hurting. But as soon as he put his hands on her instantly, she's restored and began to glorify God. You see, the Mayo Clinic also said about this disease 
If you go and look it up, it will say, there is no found cure for ankylosing spondylitis. But do you know what the Mayo Clinic had not done? They had not consulted Luke chapter 13. Amen, church? The Mayo Clinic did not take into account the healing power of Jesus. And think what this moment must have been like for this woman. For the first time, maybe in 18 years, she gets to look up and see somebody eye to eye, and it's none other than Jesus Christ. You consider what's happening. This woman went to the synagogue for 18 years and remained in bondage. For 18 years, she was spiritually oppressed until she finally met Jesus at the synagogue. Look, there's a major warning in that even for us. Hear me, friends. You can come to church for years and still be in bondage. Like maybe not physical bondage like this woman. But you can come and still be in spiritual bondage and still be held captive by your sin. Look, here's a reality for us this morning. You can come to church your entire life, but until you have a genuine encounter with Jesus at the root level, nothing's really going to change about your life. Let me see one of the things that the true encounter with Jesus does. One of the things that changes about us is how we view people. Church, in this scene, let, let's not overlook how different Jesus' values are as opposed to what we often value. You see, our world values the well-to-do, don't we? But Jesus values those who can't do. We value the successful and the important, but Jesus values the simple and oftentimes the unimportant. You see, our culture would say we value those who stand out, while Jesus values those who can't even stand up. While our world loves the people that are hard to forget, what we see in this thing that Jesus loves the ones that the world often forgets. And the truth is, this woman probably had been forgotten by the world. But Jesus did not forget her. He had compassion for her suffering. And hurting, suffering, friend, here today, Jesus has not changed. He still has compassion for your suffering. And look, you, you might hear that and think, well, if Jesus has compassion for my suffering, then why doesn't he heal me like he's healed this woman? Why am I still dealing with this chronic pain? Why am I still dealing with this emotional hurt? Like, Jesus, I, I've got some crooked things in my life that could use some straightening, too. Listen, every case is different. But I will say many times, God doesn't heal us so that we will look more to him and so that we might look more like him. You see, God knows that if he heals us now in this moment, that it won't produce in us what we need to have produced. It's like Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4. Therefore, we don't give up. And friends, sometimes do we not feel like giving up? But we don't give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So look, many times God doesn't take away your pain. He doesn't take away your hardships. So it will produce in us a desire for something more. A desire specifically for the eternal life to come. That's what he says in verse 18. So we don't focus on what is seen, but we focus on what's unseen. For what's seen, that's temporary. What is unseen is eternal. And for this woman, after this healing, it doesn't take her long to worship. She's like, hey, hey, bring the band back out. Like being hunched over for 18 years, it's made it really hard to sing. Now I've got that diaphragm ready, right? Like she's asking, man, do you know rattle? I'll even sing that song like Sloppy Wet Kiss. I'll do anything, right? Like, I'm just ready to praise the Lord. So she's in a good mood. And if the story ended there, we'd be in a good mood. But the story doesn't end there. Because after you've got the desperate woman with a crooked back, now you've got something different. Now you've got a religious man with a crooked heart. Now let's imagine this for a second. Let's imagine that someone here this morning was here, and they had been in a wheelchair for the past 20 years. So they 
for 20 years had been a paraplegic. And all of a sudden, Jesus shows up to our service and tells that person, get up and walk, and they do. Now, now that would be amazing, wouldn't it? That, that would probably be a top five Sunday in the history of our church, at least top ten. Like, like we're going to be blown away if that happens. But what if when that happened, I got so angry at what Jesus had done that I stood up here and said, guys, what are you all doing? What, why are you clapping? Why, why are you amening? And look, you know it's a special Sunday if we're amening at this church. Like there's a miracle happening. But look, look, what if I said you should not be happy that Jesus has done that? Because he didn't use the healing oil we got back there in the office. Like, like why are you all excited? Because we've got in our constitution that you don't heal anybody before we dismiss the children's church. Like, like, that seems like an insane response, doesn't it? That doesn't feel anywhere close to appropriate. Yeah, that's exactly the response this, again, the leader of the synagogue, this essential pastor gives. He's angry. He's indignant. He's fired up. Because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Look, think about how sad, how silly this response is. Because the Sabbath, it was given as a day of rest. And Jesus has just given this woman who'd been searching for rest for 18 years, rest that she was desperately after. The Sabbath was set aside as a day to focus and worship on God. And this woman was worshiping God like never before. Like the whole idea of the Sabbath in the commandments that God gave was so that God's people, they might remember that God does for his people what we cannot do for ourselves. And here was this woman who could not do anything herself to get better. And God in the flesh has done for her in that moment what nobody else could. So this is the perfect example of the whole point of the Sabbath. But guess what? This religious leader, this pastor missed the point. Look, I know we tend to feel really bad for the woman in this story. Like it's easy for us be compassionate towards Debbie Downer. Or, or maybe her name is different now. Maybe she's Debbie Delightful. Or, or maybe she's Little Debbie, right? <laughs> I, I've never met a Little Debbie and not been led to worship church <laughs> of any kind. But look, I think we should also be compassionate towards Pastor Chuck. Like I think even though Jesus has some harsh words for Chuck, he's actually showing him compassion, church. Listen to me, being compassionate towards people isn't always giving them what they want, but it's actually caring enough about them to give them what they need. And look, hear me, friends, many times what people need more than anything else, they just need to hear the truth. And the more you think about what the synagogue leader is doing, what, he, what he's saying, the more you realize he needed to hear the truth that his heart was way more crooked than this lady's back. And as a result, he, he's so blinded by his legalism, by tradition, that he meant what it truly meant to be a worshiper of God. This man had missed what it meant to actually love his neighbor. Like, like, can you imagine being so concerned with what you think God wants? With how you, how you feel, hey, this is how God should reign and rule, that you miss how he actually does reign and rule. That you miss one of the most important realities in God's kingdom is being kind and compassionate to those who are suffering. And sadly, we probably can't imagine it because we still see this kind of thing today. People who are more concerned with what somebody wears to church as opposed to those who are hurting in the church. People who are more concerned with the style of music that's played as opposed to focusing on the glorious and holy God that we're singing to. Look, we can be more focused on doing things a certain way at a certain time and not being focused on what actually bring, brings God glory. Amen, church? It's very easily done. It's like we have this notion that God must rule in the same way that we would rule if we were God. And what that leads to every time is a legalistic rules over concern for people, traditions over love of people mentality. 
And many times, look, this is where religion misses it. This is where we miss it often. Listen to me. Coming up with more rules. That's not the solution to the problem in our hearts, but it's actually a symptom of the evil that might be in our hearts. Like the reality is, we might think coming up with more rules to keep, hey, that will get us closer to God. When in fact, it's those very rules that often keep us and even others far from Him. Hear me, you see, the good news of Jesus has never been do this, do that, and then God will love you. No, the message of the gospel, the reason this is good news, is that God already loves us. So much so that he was willing to send his only son to die in our place. So that we, if we repent of our sin, might be made right before him. But look, it's that truth that actually leads us close. It's that truth that leads us to obedience. Hear me, the kingdom of God is not advanced through making more rules. Now, now let's be clear, we're not to be antinomians. So we're not to be anti-law. Where we live as if, hey, we don't have any boundaries. No, the Bible is clear. God has given us boundaries that are good for us. Amen. These boundaries are here to keep us safe. It's like if you ever had small kids and you live near a busy road. What you might do, you might put up a fence to keep them out of that road. And that's what God has done with his law. He's trying to keep us from getting ran over. But we don't need, we don't need fences inside of those fences. And then another fence inside of that fence. So we don't need a fence and a leash and a shock collar for our children, do we? So I'm like, I don't know, maybe. Look, I'm not going to lie, we've leashed our kids before. We've never shock collared them, though. The Lord would never allow that. But look, those things are not good for them. And it's the same in God's kingdom. You see, the way God's kingdom operates... It's not demonstrated by placing extra boundaries on people. Sometimes that's what we do with religion. That's what we do as churches. But it's actually demonstrated by having compassion on people. God's kingdom church is demonstrated by seeing people set free from spiritual oppression. From bondage like this woman was. God's kingdom is shown when we see people break free from addictions and depression, and anxiety by the power of Christ. It's the very idea of the kingdom of God that Jesus uses to actually tie all of this together. So that's kind of how he concludes this scene, verses 18 through 21. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And what can I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and became a tree. And the birds of the sky nested in its branches. Again, he said, what can I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like leaven that a woman took and mixed in the 50 pounds of flour until all of it was leaven. And we might hear that and go, what is Jesus talking about? He just healed a woman. He just rebuked a preacher. And now it sounds like he's reading fortune cookies. Like, Like, what is this? But each of these examples should put into our minds something that starts out seemingly small, something insignificant. But ultimately, it will grow to have a major impact. So a little mustard seed, it's tiny, but it can grow to be an impressive tree that birds can live in. So that they say that tree can grow to be almost 15 feet tall. We, we know a small bit of yeast or leaven can have a massive influence. It can cause what we see here, even a 50-pound biscuit to rise. That's what it's saying. Like This is what the kingdom of God is like. If you give this kingdom time, it will change everything. See, it feels like Jesus gives these parables here to really say to this group of people, to this group of people who witnessed this miracle, who heard this rebuke, he's saying, hey, you all think you're rejoicing now? You all think that my adversaries are put to shame. Now is just getting started. It's just like that mustard seed. Just give it time. Listen, we know historically this proved to be true. Because within 40 years from when Jesus would give his parables, the kingdom of God, Christ and his kingdom, would have penetrated every single city in the Roman Empire. Like we know that there may have been around a thousand Christians 
in AD 40. So think about this, a thousand Christians, that's 0.0017% of the population. But only 300 years later, there are around 34 million Christians, or 56% of the population. Look, we hear that, that's a significant impact, is it not, church? I think we know that a seemingly small thing, in, in the grand scheme of things, 2,000 years ago, it changed everything. Because hear me, to the Romans, when he came to Jesus, it was just another death, wasn't it, church? To the Romans, it's, it's just another crucifixion. To the Romans, it's just another dead body in a tomb. Like this Jesus being king thing, that will pass soon enough just like it has with other people proclaiming kingship and authority. But in time, what did they learn? In time, they learned that death was a death unlike any other. Amen, church? For the death of the man named Jesus, it was only temporary. They would learn that even death could not hold this man, and the grave could not keep him. So look, just because we can't tell a tree is growing doesn't mean it isn't. And just because we may not see God's kingdom growing also doesn't mean it won't. No, his kingdom will grow. It will stand. It will be exactly what he wants it to be. And we can find assurance and confidence in that. See, what well, we've got to be careful. We cannot become impatient with what God is doing, but must trust that whatever he's doing will ultimately work. And I know we hear that, and that can be hard for us to believe. Because we're living in this season that we refer to as the already but not yet. And what we mean by that is already Jesus has come. And he's established his rule. He's established his reign on earth. But still yet, they're suffering at multiple levels. But still yet, Jesus hasn't come back to finally consummate, to finalize his full reign. But look, on that day when he comes back, what will the kingdom of God be like when it's fully, finally consummated? Look, it's hard to tell. We don't know exactly. But what we do know is there will be no more crooked backs on that day. We know on that day when he consummates his reign, there will be no more chronic pain. We know there will be no more suffering at any level for those who have believed on Christ. And so the question for us this morning then, so what do we do in the meantime? I would say we look to give his kingdom roots to grow. We look to give God's kingdom space to flourish. And how do we do that? What does that look like? It looks like exactly what we've seen in this story. Just a few quick things will be done this morning. Living for the kingdom of God looks like caring for the hurting. And for us, I think we need to consider how attentive are we to those who are hurting? How much attention are we paying to those who are suffering around us? I think it's very easy for us to turn a blind eye towards the hurting when we aren't the ones hurting. Look, wherever there is suffering, Wherever there is need, that's where we as Christians should be. We should be ministering in the name of our compassionate king. Hear me, church. Let's be very careful as we approach a somewhat newer season in our church life. God's kingdom is not about fancy stage lights. It's not about bigger buildings. It's not about bigger budgets. That's not his concern. It's about caring for people. In the same way that God has cared for us through Christ. Then secondly, what does living for the kingdom look like? It also looks like rejoicing when things are going other people's way, but does not seem to be going your way. And, and I think this is important for us to consider because, church, let's be honest, this is not natural. So it's not natural when somebody else gets the job and you don't. When somebody else gets the award and you don't, when, when somebody else gets the last donut out there and you don't, it's not natural to be happy for them, is it? No, rather than being happy, we're looking for reasons to be upset. So rather than rejoicing at what happened to them, we sulk and we complain at what didn't happen to us. But you think about this scene. Let me ask you a question. How many people were healed on this day that we know of? Just one. Just one that we know of, the woman who had the back issue. But here's what's amazing. How many people on that day were rejoicing? Go back to verse 17. When he had said these things, the whole crowd 
was rejoicing. You see, one was healed. Do you think she was the only one with problems that day at church? That's doubtful. Now, she might have had the most obvious, but in a crowd like that, in a crowd like this, there's not just one person coming here this morning with a problem. Not just one person who's here who needs a touch from Jesus. But you see, that didn't stop the rest of those still with problems from rejoicing for her. I think some of us might come here with a mentality, and we'd say, but why should I praise God? Why should I be happy? Jesus didn't fix my problems. Where's my miracle? I'm still hurting. I, I'm still lonely. I'm still struggling. And I would say this. The people here who are rejoicing may not have got healed, but someone they loved did, and that was the source of their joy. Look, this is important for us in the culture we live. It's good to praise God when he does something good in your life. Amen, church? We should praise God. But it might be even better to praise God when he does something good in the life of someone else. Listen, being a part of the kingdom of God means that you are a part of the family of God. Whether you realize it or not, the people around this room, they are now your spiritual family. And you look around, well, we got some crazy uncles, amen? We got that cousin that we're hoping they got to work the day of the family reunion. But look, this is who we've been given and because this is our family, that means, hear me, when we come together, it's not only about what God is doing in your life. Let me say that again. When we come together, it's not only about what God is doing only in your life. But it's also about what is God doing in the life of your brothers and sisters. So we might show up on a Sunday having a hard time. We might show up thinking, I'm still in the valley. But then we look and we see, hey, what has God done in their life? Look at how God has brought them out. I'll rejoice, I'll praise God because of his grace in their life. And then lastly this morning, living for the kingdom of God, it simply looks like trusting God is working, even when that work appears slow. And again, we just go back to this woman who for 18 years, struggle with this condition for all these years she can't even stand up straight yet she still kept coming to the house of god i just wonder how many of us if we're honest would have said 18 years of suffering god must not care about me so why should i care about him 18 years of hardship and embarrassment but this woman kept coming and look, I think she kept coming because she was hoping that one day God would restore her. I think she kept coming, hoping that one day the problems she came with would not be the problems that she left with. And even though it took a long time, that was exactly the case when this woman met Jesus. And listen, it's the same for us. If you have an encounter with the one who died in your place, if you have a true relationship with the one who put death to death, and that has led you to live for him with your life, I just leave you with this thought this morning. The problems you're dealing with now will one day no longer be problems. They'll simply be evidence of God's grace. Look, not because we deserve it, because this Jesus is a compassionate king, because he is compassionate towards those who suffer, because ultimately Christ suffered for sinners. And this morning, as a man comes up, that's what we celebrate, as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And so maybe you're, you're new 